This was an idea that sort of came together um, for us on the staff when we were having a conversation with some of our colleagues who work in the housing world and the sort of conversation around how we often use units as a measurement of what we're doing in housing. How many units have you built? How many units, units, units? And we realized that the word shelter, house, and home all meant very different things and all signaled very different approaches to the work and what we were doing. And then we realized, sort of combing through the folks that were in our community and projects we'd been able to support, we have three projects that really, in important ways, sort of illustrate what some of those differences are and play with some of those tensions and play with some of those gaps. And so we were thrilled that Regina Smith, who is the very important person at the Kresge Foundation, I can never remember your title, Managing Director at the Kresge Foundation for the Arts and Culture Portfolio, um, has actually been doing a lot of really important work with her colleagues in Kresge in housing and sort of talking about the importance of housing as a platform and making sure that that is in place and stable and can be built upon. And we've asked her to be in conversation with Ellen Baxter from Broadway Housing Communities and their most recent project I'm sure she'll be talking about uh, includes Museum of Art and Storytelling in the center of a permanent supportive housing uh, for families in Upper Manhattan, along with Nicole Carruth, who is a relatively recent addition to the McCall, McCall Center, so we're thrilled to have you with us, um, and Kaki Dimmick, who was, I believe, actually part of writing the grant for the um, project that we were able to invest in in Charlottesville and is now working in city government even more broadly on the issues of poverty and housing and home and shelter there. And this is also a particularly timely topic for Seattle. If any of you haven't been following the local discourse, just Google sort of Seattle and homeless and you'll see that there's a lot going on. Uh, everything from sort of the right to encampments to Amazon uh, just announcing a permanent homeless shelter as part of the most recent campus it's building. So we thought that this was particularly timely. So um, that is all the vamping I have. So with that, I would love to turn the stage over to Regina, to Kaki, to Nicole, and to Ellen. So please join me in making them feel welcome. Um, a couple of things that I want to tee up. Uh, we had a fabulous conversation uh, last week or the week before, um, kind of talking about this panel and how we wanted, what, kind of what we wanted to talk about and what we wanted to share. And um, what, are, what are some of the, the really important things that they want to, um, to share with you all? Um, but I framed that conversation um, around um, Matthew Desmond's work. And for those of you who um, are in the housing realm and understand um, the vexing and really uh, challenging issues around home, shelter, and homelessness, um, what Harvard sociologist and uh, MacArthur Genius um, Award winner, um, Matthew Desmond, uh, Pulitzer Prize, 2017 Pulitzer Prize uh, book, um, Evicted, really talks about the vivid and unsettling issues around homelessness and housing uh, insecurity. And so that's really kind of where I, where I want to start the conversation and, and, and ask each of, each of our colleagues here to you know, talk about um, how they came to this work, how they're passionate, what are you passionate about in terms of this work, um, but as a way to tell you about what they're actually doing. So Kaki, let's start with you. Well, I'm passionate about a great number of things, including wildlife rehab and drawing animals, um, little monsters in my notebooks, but, um, but I, <laughs> I'm also very passionate about uh, housing and homelessness, and um, I'm particularly interested in uh, why it is that as a culture and as a community and as a, a sort of policy-making bodies, uh, we have not um, just uh, made policy decisions or funding decisions or community decisions or decisions about heart and love and kindness um, to say that people shouldn't be homeless. So I think that's astonishing. And it's, um, it's uh, I don't mean that in a sort of naive way, like a Mr. Smith kind of goes to Washington kind of way, but like in a genuine way. It costs so much money for people to be homeless, and it's so stupid for people to be homeless. And 
Um, and I think that sort of national policy is geared around the fact that we, um, we think it's their fault. And so that's deep seated in all of our hearts. And so we can't figure out even when it makes sense how to do it. So I'm, I'm delighted to be part of some solutions in Charlottesville where we have a homeless population that is, uh, too big for us to feel comfortable. Um, but also small enough that if we did something radical and we did something really cool, we might actually totally change it which is really invigorating and exciting uh, to be part of a community solution that might change that. So among those things, we have um, really revamped our, our community-wide coalition so that we're working well together outside of silos. We're, uh, I don't know that we are in one silo, but we are connected. Like we have little bridge, like little like crossover walks between our silos, and we visit each other a lot in there. Um, and sometimes we have this vision of the greater good, which is kind of cool. Um, and we started a, a multi-service day shelter called The Haven, uh, which is sort of dedicated to a kind of radical hospitality. So um, the assumption was that we're going to provide some food, we're going to provide a safe place for people to be during the day, we're going to try to uh, and connect people to housing and the services they need, but mostly we're going to get to know our neighbors, and we're going to uh, make eye contact, and we're going to know people's names, and we're going to use the transactions of I need a towel for a shower um, as a way to get to know somebody. And we're going to do that so consistently that people are going to begin to build trust with each other over time and, and start to change the way we approach the problem. Um, and as part of that, we started um, uh, uh, sort of accidentally a, a collaboration with an arts organization um, that initially just needed some office space. But in while they were in our building, we formed good relationships and we thought, They've got pretty good juju, and so maybe we should work together. Um, and so uh, their first project that we did was an artist in residence program where we had artists who had studio space in the building, and then they did some kind of creative intervention with guests downstairs um, of our day shelter. Um, and that naturally led to the uh, application for um, an art place grant where we're doing a creative placemaking project with uh, homeless folks as they move from homelessness into housing. So our Creative placemaking is actually private space, is interior space. Um, and it's really, um, the baseline is about providing as many choices as possible. Um, being homeless, homeless in any community is about being dependent and not having a lot of choices. So if you want to take advantage of the free meals, if you want to be in the shelter, if you want to, you have to be in line for your laundry, you have to be in line for your shower, you have to be in line at a certain time, and you have to be compliant while you're in that line, even when we do it really humanely. And so we, we calculated that we think homeless folks in our community have about 90 minutes to themselves a day to, that they can make choices. Um, so we, this sort of baseline intervention is about creating as many opportunities for people to make choices. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. Um, let's see. I have a disclaimer. I'm very new to McCall Center. Um, and so our Art Place project was conceived by Lisa Hoffman, who's the former associate director at McCall Center, and I have um, been charged with moving the project forward. So I am not only new to my job and to um, this work on housing and homelessness, but also to the city of Charlotte and the American South. Um, I have a background as a contemporary art curator and have um, spent a lot of time working with artists who are addressing racial, economic, and food justice, um, especially where those three things intersect. Um, and so I'm, I'm honored to take over this project um, and to um, think about housing and homelessness because I think the work that I've done, also, it already intersects with so many of the things we're probably gonna talk about today. Awesome, thank you. Ellen. Uh, my name is Ellen, and I'm not new to homelessness. Uh, I'm old to homelessness. And I uh, live in New York State, which has the greatest uh, wealth and equality than any other state in the nation. Uh, and uh, in New York City, uh, that every night has uh, 63,000 men, women, and children living in the public emergency shelters. That's 63,000. And that doesn't count all the people who are sleeping outside in the streets. And it doesn't count people that are doubled and tripled up on couches who have no lease or no rights in their name. 
And in addition to being uh, a location of great wealth disparity, it's also the state that has uh, the most racially uh, segregated public education system in the nation. And one might think that would be Alabama or Mississippi, but it's not, it's New York State. And so my work around homelessness began in 1979 when uh, I asked an official working for New York University how many people had died of hypothermia in his experience. And he told me that during the cold months in New York City, between 35 and 55 people were brought into the New York City morgue who were thought to be homeless. Um, and so we took that interview uh, with that official and the stories that we collected from people living on the streets and in the bus stations and terminals, and we went to New York State Supreme Court because we had found with a public interest lawyer that there was a phrase in the New York State Constitution that says the government shall provide food, shelter, and clothing to the destitute. And that's a phrase that was an amendment to the New York State Constitution during the Great Depression. And to our astonishment, we were young activists at that time. The uh, New York State Supreme Court ruled in favor of homeless people and ordered the city and state of New York to shelter every man, woman, and child uh, who was homeless. So that was a landmark uh, decision. Uh, so the reason that there are 63,000 people in shelters every night is not because the city and state of New York are uh, acting benevolently or doing so out of uh, good government policy. It's because they're under court order to do so. And every administration since Mario Cuomo and Mayor Koch has been under that court order spanning all these years. So part of my responsibility is, is uh, to monitor that uh, legal right and make sure that government doesn't try to take it back because generally they, each administration comes up with a new plan to uh, compromise that fundamental right to shelter. But of course that's not a right to housing, it's simply a right to emergency so you don't freeze to death. And I should uh, say also that the majority of the 63,000 are children, uh, mm -hmm. women and children. And you will not be surprised to know that more than 90% are people of color living in the public emergency shelter system. In my experience, it's one of the most visible uh, manifestations of contemporary racism and inequality, certainly in New York City and state, and you be can begin to see it across the nation as well. So it's in that backdrop that we began uh, not being satisfied with the conditions that government would create emergency shelters, and they started to look like jails where there were the door wasn't locked so you could leave, but there were cots lined up, uh, and the conditions were quite inhumane in the shelters that were created during the 80s and still are now. And so we resolved to uh, shift gears and advance an agenda that would provide housing, you know, permanent housing with people having a lease in their own name uh, and certain rights as tenants to housing. Uh, so we, we launched this notion of supportive housing back in the uh, early 1980s and learned where the government could be found, where the government had some money. Um, so we learned at the local level, uh, state level, and federal level where you could find money to create housing. And supportive housing really boils down to a permanent place to live and some extra help. So the project, we developed seven buildings over these decades, heading into the fourth decade, decade I guess. And 
uh, we've learned a lot of lessons over those years. And one of them uh, is about the importance of working steadily in a community. All seven of our projects are located in West Harlem and Washington Heights. And having that base in a community for 40 years gives you a really, a certain strength because one knows where the corruption is, one knows where the leadership is, one knows where the artists are. And so that tenure of work in one neighborhood, it's what's allowed us to create uh, the Sugar Hill development that's our seventh and that represents a, the evolution of, of our practice over time. And we've created 124 extra affordable apartments, um, including 20% set aside for homeless families and individuals. And Ellen, you do have slides for, of, of Sugar Hill Project, don't you? Uh, there is one here that's a household uh, signing a lease, moving into the Sugar Hill uh, development, and that just opened in 2015. And in addition to the housing there, uh, we have a preschool uh, that serves children from zero to five that's serving the wider community, because in, in our neighborhood, 70% of the children are born into poverty. And so uh, we decided we would dedicate the majority of the square footage of, our, uh, of the Sugar Hill development to children uh, and trying to change the trajectory of their future by creating the stability of a permanent home, uh, high quality early education, and the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. Now we were really fortunate in, uh, because we didn't know anything about contemporary architecture. We asked uh, friends uh, in the architecture field to guide us in how to select an architect. And we had gotten a little cocky by then and said, well, why don't we issue an RFP? Because everybody is asking us to respond to an RFP. So we issued an RFP to architects. And they, in the city of New York, and we received 26 proposals that helped to educate us about what our options were. And we were fortunate to select uh, David Ajay, uh, who, uh, is best known for recently opening the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And the Sugar Hill Project is his largest project in New York City. So we. So, so I'm going to I'm going to pause you there because okay. I want to try because we got to leave something. We got girl, we got an hour. <laughs> <laughs> to spill it all out at one time. Now, hold on. Time. <clears throat> so, so. Um, my question actually piggybacks off of, of, off of um, something that Ellen just raised up is that, so what does this have to do with arts and culture? So we've, got, we've been talking about really kind of the dire situation that we find ourselves in and many individuals find themselves in in our country of being without shelter and, and homeless. Um, and, and then there are others that um, struggle to find affordable housing. So what's the role of arts and culture in this? So it's, it's architecture, being, being able to commission someone like, and work with someone like David Ajay, but also building in um, a, a museum uh, as part of the infrastructure. But Nicole and, and, and Kaki, I'm curious, so, so how are you all, there's artists in residence, but arts and culture, how, how exactly have you integrated arts and culture into the conversation around homelessness and housing? If we could go back to my first slide, because I should have given some context. Yeah. Um, the church. Yeah, because it, it really starts with our building, speaking of architecture. So um, McCall Center is an artist residency and contemporary art space that is in the former Associate Reform Presbyterian Church in Uptown Charlotte, North Carolina. That building was constructed in 1926, and at that time was um, 
not only a place of community refuge, it was a symbol of Charlotte's uh, growing prosperity during the development boom of that era. The congregation was active until about the 1950s when it started to dwindle um, due to post-war movement to the suburbs. The church was sold, it stood empty for many years, and it became a place where people who were experiencing homelessness sought shelter. Um, a woman went into the building in 1984 and started a small fire to keep warm. The whole building caught fire, which is the uh, image you see, um, and all that was left was a burned out shell. And that shell was acquired by Bank of America in 1995 because their CEO wanted to establish an urban artist colony, as we used to call artist residencies, a place where artists could live and create and share their creative processes with the public. So when McCall Center opened in 1999, the building was again a symbol of Charlotte's rising wealth. Um, Hugh McCall is often credited with growing Charlotte into a financial capital. So if we could go to the next slide. Today, McCall Center sits at the intersection of extreme wealth and extreme poverty. So where you have the city's emergency shelters and homeless service providers concentrated north of the center, you have Bank of America and Wells Fargo headquarters, sports arenas and museums, and an increasing number of um, luxury apartment buildings located south of us and coming closer to McCall Center. Um, on the one hand, Charlotte is celebrated as a progressive and liberal southern city. On the other hand, uh, it ranked last in a recent study of economic mobility in 50 of the nation's largest cities. So if you were born in, into poverty in Charlotte, you were more likely to stay in poverty. Um, Charlotte also ranks extra low nationally in terms of access to affordable housing. Um, and there's a significant <laughs> racial disparity in all of this. Black people are 34% of Charlotte's population, but make up 80% of people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so to your question about the arts, uh, the arts are part of, arts and culture is part of what we do. And with this Art Place grant, we're really um, turning our focus inward and reflecting on our place in the North Tryon area and our potential role in this place regarding housing and homelessness. I'm personally interested in um, this, this principle of neighborliness and how artists can influence people to be better neighbors, uh, meaning to act on behalf of each other and on behalf of an entire neighborhood to improve living conditions for everyone, regardless of differences in race or class. Um, I'm also interested in what McCall Center and other art organizations can learn from artists as we're trying to develop strategies to foster stronger neighborhood relationships. And so what has that looked like? Um, so our project is laid out in three phases. And the, the first phase um, is called building our neighboring skills. I, my first instinct when I got to McCall Center was to ask questions about the neighborhood and how we identify a neighbor. I was struck by how our community partner, Urban Ministry, refers to their clients not as homeless, but as neighbors, um, which begs the question, who is my neighbor? And so um, every person on staff has been asked to take a weekly walk within a quarter mile, quarter mile radius of the center and talk to someone they don't know. Um, to remain open, to remain curious, and to take a photograph that represents their experience. I should say that we've adopted an artist process, an artist who I'm working with in the fall. This is part of her way of coming to know a city. Um, and so they're supposed to take their photograph, put it in a Google Doc, and write a short summary of their experience. And so we've been doing this for about the past five weeks. Um, and so far we're learning a lot about the assumptions we've made about our neighborhood and the muscles that we need to build to be um, an organization that's continually learning and is an active part of its community. All right, thank you. And, and Kaki, I'm gonna ask you to, to speak to um, reconciling value clusters. What does it mean inside? And how, how, did, how did you kind of wrestle with um, the concept of integrating arts and culture into the city, the organization? Well, um, when we started with the premise that um, radical change happens through individual connections. And so we can make policy and systematic and neighborhood and community changes all we want, but the way we actually incorporate and, and integrate um, awareness or understanding is through personal connection. And so we needed to create an opportunity, and so the transaction was one of those ways that we do that. But 
but also um, that's the artists in residence who would come to the uh, day shelter would just start making some work in the corner uh, of the dining room. And people through natural curiosity, our guests would come over and say, what are you doing? And can I do it too? Or can I sit with you? Or can I, there was no, uh, there was no lesson. There was no uh, start to finish. There was just parallel engagement. Um, and through that conversation or through that activity, conversation started, right? Uh, and some sharing um, across um, difference or a different experience. Um, and so I, I will say, I mentioned that because we felt like we were already doing something that was pretty good. And so we were pretty sure we started in the right place already. Um, and so, and I don't mean that we were cocky or arrogant or self-congratulatory the whole time, but like a lot of the time, <laughs> we were pretty sure that we were doing this better than most, most everybody else in our community. And so, uh, and, and that feels good, right? So, I mean, I'm not saying that it was just all terrible, but we felt pretty good about what we we're doing. Um, and so when we started imagining this, um, housing to home project, we thought we were already starting with some pretty serious self-reflected um, uh, good values that we were pretty sure would ground this work and that we wouldn't be surprised by too much other than those personal relationships. And really we were setting up an opportunity for the artists that we were engaging and, and the other service providers and our homeless guests and participants to be surprised by their interactions, but we didn't expect to be surprised. Uh, and I mention that because um, there were times in which we had to really uh, to think. And so one of those times is, uh, for example, when um, we were pretty sure that uh, we were, actually, I think we wrote it into the Art Place grant that we were going to use some of the stipend money that we were uh, using with our guests and our, our program participants to go to the groovy upscale thrift store um, to buy stuff for people's new places. And we felt good about that because it's um, reuse. Uh, we felt good about that because uh, we're, it's local. Um, so uh, we were sitting really nice and comfortable on our values. Um, and what we heard really quickly from our homeless guests was that they always get the leftover shit. Um, they always get the secondhand stuff. And so they wanted new stuff from Walmart. That's where people shop, right? So they wanted, and so that really, that hurt us to go to Walmart, I'm just telling you, it hurts a lot. But we, uh, Ellie and Maureen, who are in the front here, who are, are responsible for housing to home implementation, uh, spent a lot of time in Walmart. And so, and that's a constant reconciliation of values uh, around the Walmart. So that's one place. And the other was when our guests um, immediately, when they were like, "What? I have money I can spend on my place, I want a TV, right? And so that, that hurt us, because we were like, TV, that's, we can't, no, no. <laughs> but our guests are isolated, they're lonely, they're disconnected from popular culture, and frankly, we're all watching Transparent, we're all watching Game of Thrones, and we use that as freaking currency in our mm -hmm. social lives, right? Mm -hmm. And so why would we deny our guests that? So we had to wrestle with that. Um, and, then, and then there's the day-to-day -day, uh, sort of design value judgment that comes up, like when you take a guest to Target and they buy every single thing in zebra print they can buy. Um, and so you, you don't think that you're judging about that, but you're judging about it. <laughs> uh, so you got to live with it, and, and you got to reconcile that all the time. And so that's the point, right? The point is that we find a way to connect. We find a way to engage. We find a way to listen deeply, even though we're uncomfortable. And because, frankly, our guests are uncomfortable with us in this intervention space the whole time. And so it's good and right that we should find ourselves also uncomfortable and still persisting in that conversation and that relationship. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So Ellen, um, Talk a little bit about working through disorder and um, bridging silos at the level of practice. So we decided to manage all our properties ourselves rather than farm it out to somebody who does property management because we were interested in the quality of uh, the service that was extended to tenants. Uh, so the structure that we've set up is that tenants who live in our buildings, formerly homeless tenants and the Sugar Hill tenants, uh, provide 24 hours, seven day a week coverage of the buildings. And so that 
puts a staff of about 80 people uh, on Broadway Housing Community staff, and they're like the front desk service uh, to the building that they live in. And it creates a very participatory management system. Uh, it's a challenge to administer, uh, but it does ensure uh, a quality of service that neighbors treat uh, other tenants that live in their building as neighbors. And the, the tenants on the front desk are responsible for keeping track of repairs that tenants request, for mothers that want specific instructions about who can, which teenagers can enter their apartment when they're at work and which cannot. Uh, the tenants can leave uh, very specific instructions in terms of call me at, uh, at my job when my son gets home. I want to make sure that he gets home. So the tenant uh, concierge service is a very sensitive uh, dimension of our practice that we've carried into all seven buildings over time. It also turned out to be the most cost efficient structure because homeless people certainly do not want security guards at the front door of their building. There's, there's been enough people in uniforms that have guarded them in jails and psychiatric hospitals and institutions. So by shifting uh, the service to neighbors, it's worked much better. Um, but creating uh, fair housing like that, that's sensitive to people's needs while running a preschool and complying with the Department of Education's standards of what's uh, acceptable, and uh, launching a new ch chartered cultural institution, um, it gets disorderly, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> and so it's, it's trying to have uh, standards of practice across the housing, art, and educational work uh, that is cohesive. And we're still working on it. It's only been, uh, we're just coming up onto the second year that our museum's been open. Um, we've gone through three directors already <laughs> uh, because it's hard for people from the cultural arena to fit with a community-based uh, advocacy organization that does housing and education too. Uh, there's no hierarchy, you know, so it's, we're learning still. Well, let, let's continue that thread of, of, of learning. Um, what's interesting is that uh, over time, what's interesting is that uh, each of you are at different stages in development and implementation of your projects um, as well, not just from an, uh, an art place perspective, but um, just in terms of just the evolution of the activities. So Ellen, you talked about, you know, over time, seven buildings. Um, Haki, you've talked. You've been in one position, moved in this position, and 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 Nicole, you're very you're very new to this particular um, uh, place at the McCall Center, but you have a history of working with social practice artists. Um, and so, what are what are the lessons um, that that because it's not all pretty, <laughs> and it doesn't all work all the time. What are what are some of the lessons and challenges that that you would lift up? And specifically at the, I mean, you could go anywhere with that question, but yeah. it's like, <laughs> just specifically at the intersection of arts and arts and housing. Well, for us, I feel like um, those opportunities where we were uncomfortable to really sit with that discomfort and, and to not run away from it, not to, um, to dismiss it either, but to really try to understand it, where it was coming from, and, and double down on our commitment to providing choice and to providing agency. So what, whenever there was an opportunity to make a decision about something, um, then we said, okay, what's the, what's, the, what's the decision that allows our guests the highest degree of agency and choice in this? Um, and if we didn't know what that was, we asked them. Um, and. Um, and if they didn't believe that we really wanted to know, which they often didn't, that we would ask them again or in a new way. Um, so I, I feel like the lesson that we learned is really around the value question, which is to, to know what you're really trying to do, right? So often we do um, community development or creative placemaking or even housing 
Um, and all of those things are practical in some way and need to happen for good, successful, thriving humans. But, um, but in the end, what we're trying to do is connect with each other because we're interdependent um, and we're always going to be better together. And so if you can stay true to that and you can say, these are the two things that really matter. We're going to connect and we're going to provide as many opportunities for people who are engaging with us to make their own choices. Then, then the lessons were always around when we screwed up and we went the other way, right? When we made a different choice or, um, or we forgot that. And so it's, um, I, it sounds a little trite when I'm saying it right now, but it, it, it feels really weighty and important to me that we would do that. Um, so that's the biggest lesson was to take the time to remember what the value was that we're providing. Hmm. Or that we're living in, not we're not providing a value, we're living in a value. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Nicole? Um, to pick, piggyback off of that, yeah, I um, am thinking about the work that we do over the next year or so as really laying the foundation for long-term work that unfolds over time and demonstrates the values that we espouse. Um, I believe very deeply in practicing what you preach, and so... You know, I want to make sure that our values show up at our front door. Um, when someone who appears to be experiencing homelessness comes through the front door, I want to know that they're received in the same way as anyone else and that they are invited to participate and partake in the work that we do. Um, I had said earlier today that, um, you know, having gone to five or six pra uh, conferences on social practice or socially engaged art in the last year, um, I find that all of them have a kind of tenor of a TED talk where everyone's talking about their successes. Um, and I just think, why do any of us come to conferences if not to be better at what we do? And in order to do that work, we need to hear about the failures and the challenges too, because um, that's part of the, we need to know the whole story. Mm -hmm. Ellen? Uh, I believe it was the positive experience we had with opening community art galleries in our earlier buildings before we got to Sugar Hill that gave us the confidence to build a museum. Uh, and we, we were powered by the artists uh, that and largely African-American and Latino artists from Washington Heights and West Harlem who had really improved our first six buildings with their work. They hold monthly exhibitions in those community art galleries. And they also said, if you're going to do a museum at Sugar Hill, you also have to have a community art gallery at Sugar Hill as well uh, to be sure that the emerging artists from this neighborhood remain uh, central to your work. So we do have a community art gallery in addition to the museum. And it's, um, the artists bring a certain sensibility to the children who they meet in the elevator. They invite the children to come to their workshops. Um, they invite uh, the teenagers to serve as docents in the museum, the homework club that's the Sugar Hill school-age kids uh, go into the museum every Thursday evening and have it to themselves. Uh, so they're, we're looking at ways to continuously uh, engage the elders from the larger community to come in and tell our story, to the, tell their story. There's something important that the, the neighborhood of Sugar Hill is a national and state historic district uh, because it is the home of the Harlem Renaissance. So we had a sacred history to elevate here. And uh, the elders have come into the museum now uh, to, ha to help uh, teach the children. And we use an arts-based curriculum in the preschool so when they go into the museum, they see common elements. And the, the uniting theme uh, between the educational curriculum and the exhibitions this year is, what does it mean to be a global citizen? Uh, that's the question all of us are asking. 
So the, uh, amongst the, the panel, they really wanted to spend uh, the balance of the time answering questions. Um, because, I mean, in an hour and just a little less than that, you can get a snippet that this is really uh, complex work. It's, it's, it's challenging and it's rewarding all at the same time. And so, um, it, it, you know, they really want to be able to um, respond to some of your, to some of your questions. Um, so, um, while you're while you're thinking, um, and I'm happy to call on whomever, but um, I'm gonna. I have a really up. Oh, yeah, Michael. Yeah. Uh, a question for Nicole. I love the the piece around. Uh, I love your piece around uh, requiring staff to walk the neighborhood once a week, mm -hmm. take a photo, and and post an essay. Um, you touched on that. You worked with an artist on that. If you could talk about that a little bit more, and is that something you think other organizations can do? And if so, what are the, what are the lessons learned? How, how, would, how would you suggest we implement an idea like that? Um, I'm not working with an artist on it, but I am working with an artist who has an exhibition at McCall Center this fall, and that is part of her process. She creates these immersive painting installations, and it starts with um, walking outdoors and capturing colors in the landscape. Um, and so she's creating a kind of um, abstract, layered uh, interpretation of a city. Um, and then there's another element to it where she's a pastry chef too. So she brings people together to have, um, to have a kind of meditative experience about the relationships to each other is through color and flavor. Um, so I said earlier, you know, I was interested in how and what McCall Center can learn from artists, and I think that's an example of um, adopting an artist strategy as the strategy for the organization in order for us to engage with our neighborhood and understand our neighborhood in a, in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. Greg, sure. With the community gallery space in each of your seven buildings, that seems like it's been going on for a while. I'm just wondering what the kernel of that was or what the beginnings of that was in your organization's kind of strategy engagement. Uh, it began uh, in 1990 when we started to uh, veer off from the conventional supportive housing structure, which is to serve uh, homeless single adults, and we began to integrate uh, our housing with children and families because the census in the homeless system was climbing. And as we did that, we realized that for the sake of the children and the teenagers there, we needed to have programs that would uh, welcome their friends to come in so that they wouldn't be living in a building where everybody knew that they were formerly homeless. So we had to create uh, activity, and artists were the most uh, welcoming uh, in our community. And so in the day uh, after school, it, the, the art gallery became the after school space. And then we take all the folding chairs and out, and in the evenings and weekends, it becomes the community art gallery. And it was a community organizer um, who was familiar with, uh, connected to many of the artists that initiated that uh, first gallery. Um, maybe one more question, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is the question um, oh. that we deal with in, in our organization. <laughs> um, so we work on this in our organization, um, and I'm wondering from all of you, if you have a perspective on this, how we could better support artists um, who are often very low income and have little in terms of a paper trail of uh, employment, um, who often don't even, aren't even eligible for affordable housing when it is, becomes available. What can we be doing more to help artists um, actually avoid homelessness or come out of homelessness mm -hmm. um, in advance? Uh, 
I'm, I'm going to softball my answer a little bit and encourage you to talk to Maureen Rondike, who's sitting right here, <laughs> whose organization is um, an arts organization with gallery space and also these uh, really deep uh, collaborative partnerships in the community, like with the Haven. But their primary mission is to support the lives of artists, and they make that very clear. Um, and so I, I really encourage you to talk to Maureen about how they're doing that. Um, but uh, I will say as part of that um, that we sort of started our housing to home intervention thinking that we were uh, pairing artists with uh, homeless folks to see what they wanted in their space and whether that would be our, uh, like a painting or a quilt or uh, a weird chair or whatever. Uh, and I think what we've experienced is that a, a huge number of them want their own art supplies. And they want us to use the money to buy art supplies so they can make the thing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think this is sort of what what you're sort of bringing up is pointing to this idea that somehow artists are distinct from homeless folks who are distinct mm -hmm. from service providers who are distinct from the rest of us, and which is not true. Those are also um, silos. We're all experiencing this uh, community together. And so assuming that somebody's in one box and not the other box is a problematic in our uh, assumption. So, I mean, we're super flexible. Also, I would just say the Haven pays people uh, all kinds of ways, uh, and not most of them uh, not known to the IRS, um, <laughs> which is a kind of <laughs> flexibility our government funders don't love. Uh, but we use our private dollars for that. <laughs> Um, and that we uh, are open enough and responsive enough to say, to hear that somebody's in a position of struggling and we use our social uh, connections to try to create some of those solutions when the more formal systems of care aren't, uh, they're not eligible for that. Um, so that's a partial answer for you. So closing comments, um, anything, one word. Um, so probably all we have uh, time for uh, one one word closing closing comment. No. I'd like to share one word. No way. It's like remove the fly. <laughs> but, you know, better together. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Two words. Mm. Go, Ellen. <laughs> uh, be persistent, and especially in affordable housing, ask the question: Who is it affordable to? Mm -hmm. Is it truly affordable? to the people who need it most. Uh, because the phrase affordable housing has gotten very slippery. Uh, and, and it's not serving the artists who need it most. And it's not serving uh, the people who need it most. Know your neighbor. Help me thank them. Another time.